be some other interesting talk going on. Well, I guess I will get started. My name is Eric Weistein. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I'd like to tell you today about a project that I and some colleagues at Wolfram have been working on for the last year or so that um, involves encoding a particular uh, subset of mathematical knowledge in computational form and exposing it uh, using the Wolfram Alpha website. The project is called ECF. And just a little summary of, of uh, what we've done and what we've been trying to do. We wanted to collect, create, and curate a new type of digital math library, where math library means not a collection of articles, but a collection of actual results that are marked up, searchable, accessible in some way, and encode the actual mathematical content. That allows you to do some very powerful things in terms of finding content, finding relationships between things, and it's something that's not really been done in any convincing way so far. So it's kind of new ground. Um, I already mentioned we want to focus on the results and theorems themselves, not just pictures of them or PDFs of them. And uh, for various reasons, all of math is an awful big subject to start with. So if we're going to do a prototype project, what do you do? You pick some subsets. And it turns out continued fractions are, uh, they're not considered hot and sexy in the math world today, but there's still a lot of beautiful non-trivial results. There's still stuff published on it, and the literature base is manageable. So a small number of people in a small number of time can kind of go through it and have some chance of codifying it. This work was actually sponsored uh, by a grant from the Sloan Foundation to the Wolfram Foundation as sort of um, a prototype for a much bigger World Heritage Digital Math Library that they envisioned being built over the next decade or decades. So there, and again, this is a very difficult problem. So I don't claim that we have uh, by any means solved the whole problem, but I'm, I've got lots and lots of examples. We have lots of content we've been able to uh, encode. And I'd like to show you what I think is kind of a start in the right direction and something that could lead to other bigger, more exciting things. We've been working on this from March of last year to just finished it up more or less last month. And the people involved were myself and Michael Trott, who's unfortunately not here today. Um, he's traveling as PIs together with our colleagues Oleg Marachev, Todd Rowland, and a very talented uh, mathematician intern, uh, Christopher Stover, who's, I believe, at Florida FSU. OK, so what did we do? Well, we went through the mathematical, relevant mathematical corpus. We mined archives we could find, collected lists of papers mostly from the older literature for copyright reasons. But once you, the good thing is once you extract the theorems, usually the theorems aren't copyrighted, just the presentation of the theorems and the text around them. So copyright isn't so much of an issue for this. Uh, here's the, the hard part is, and the part that we have not yet been able to automate, is how do you take a paper and make a marked up result that, that has some semantic content in it if the paper itself was not born digital? And the answer is, at least at the moment, you get people to go through the papers, read them, understand them, figure out what they mean, and translate that in some encoding. And of course, our encoding is Mathematica or Mathematica-like or some extension of it. Um, so we have done this. And for continued fractions, we've divided the results kind of into three main categories, results, uh, identities, and references. So here's, here's what we've been able to do. We have it turns out there, there are tables of integrals, there are tables of sums. Up until now, there has been no table of continued fraction identities. There is now, mainly thanks to Oleg Marachev sitting right here. So we have 13,000, uh, sorry, 1369 identities plus various transformations of them. We went through about 500 or more references, and we have of order 900 different results, of which about 400 are, are theorems and conjectures. And lots and lots of code behind the scenes to process them, make them look pretty, expose them in Wolfram Alpha, and do sort of interactive visualization. So what in the world would I do if I wanted to encode a mathematical theorem? I don't know what you would do, but this is actually what we did. And the sort of Wolfram Alpha concept, can blow it up a little bit, I think, of um, entities and properties, where, where you try to define your world. Everything that you want to describe is an entity, and all the properties corresponding to that entity are a property. It's like the data packlet idea, too. So we've taken a particular theorem, the hamburger convergence theorem, which is in no way related to the fine eating establishment down the road, but there's a gentleman named Hamburger. So you, you take the object, you give it a name, 
you attach some natural language spellings to it because you're going to want to be able to access this thing. So the power of Wolfram Alpha and its support to sort of support arbitrary typed in human input means we have a very flexible way we can attach spellings to it. You classify what theorem it is, you say what concepts are involved, and then you give some sort of mathematical pseudocode. Sort of, if I were writing a proof of this, how would, I, how would I build it up? I would define a set of variables or a set of intermediates. They would all come from certain classes. They would be re related in certain ways. You have givens, you have conclusions, various things. And then, of course, you have meta information such as, I don't know if you can see that, but who proved it, when was it proved? So we've done this for, for hundreds of theorems. Similarly, identities is a little more obvious, right? You, you name the identity. This happens to be a fairly famous one. Uh, named after Rogers and Ramanujan, who discovered it independently. You write down, uh, and, and of course, Mathematica has built-in continued fraction functionality. But it turns out, at the moment at least, it handles just a subset of sorts of identities that are known by people. Hopefully, in an upcoming version, it will know a lot more. And references is kind of a no-brainer. But it turns out, in Wolfram Alpha, nobody had really tried to build a bibliographic database in any one particular field and figure out how you could link all the information together and use it for searching. So we've done that. And I'll show lots of examples. This notebook uh, is on the website, so I certainly don't have time to go through all these examples. But here's some, in and I should have mentioned, because this is Wolfram Alpha, we push out a new version every week. This is all already live. In fact, it was live even before it was finished. So every input that I show here you know, is live and has been live for several months now. So the first type of inputs. Um, it's, it's not the sexiest, but of course, if you're going to describe any field of mathematics, you need definitions, you need concepts um, that are obvious to anyone in the field, but not, might not be if you're an engineer encountering this. So, and, and you also want to build theorems on what concepts do they involve. So here's just a selection of random concepts that we've defined. And here's an example. Let me see if I can actually, of course, I've cached it in case the web doesn't work. OK, and of course, I don't know how to get rid of this on a permanent basis for Wolfram Alpha use, but here you go. Common notations for continued fractions. For those of you who use Wolfram Alpha, it looks like a fairly typical result. Um, you have a nicely typeset description so humans can read it. You have stuff under the hood that is, uh, is actually the more computable version. And then you have various other information about it, like what concepts does it involve and what's it related to. So this is kind of pretty, but it's, there's not a whole lot you can compute about a definition. So the more interesting stuff comes when we get to some actual theorems. OK, so theorems and conjectures. Again, here's kind of just a laundry list of the sorts of things you can do. Uh, I'll get down here. I think at the bottom, OK. You, you can, of course, do things like who proved a theorem? When was it proved? One interesting thing that you can do that you can't do through any other means easily is, first of all, you can say, ask for theorems that involve a certain concept. So there are a lot of cool theorems that involve you know, periodic continued fractions or quadratic irrationals. We've tagged it all. You can just ask for it, and it will give you all of them. Also, you can do something that I haven't seen elsewhere, which is, say you have a given continued fraction, which in Mathematica would look like that. You can ask what theorems are applicable to an expression of that form. Because in the encoding process, we've said this is valid for things of this structure. So I can actually say, give me continued fractions that you know about that are applicable to continued fractions of this form, which is pretty cool. Actually, the mathematicians, when we go to meetings and show them this, I think this is what they like the most. The fact that, because they, you know, they don't, nobody's ever been able to do even a first step before. And we've got lots more steps to do, but the fact that it works at all is, is pretty darn cool. At least we think it is. OK, so here's the promised hamburger convergence theorem. And again, we have a nicely typeset version so humans can read it. We have, we're using a little bit of the power of Wolfram Alpha's annotation mechanism down here. You can see there, there is actually more information in here than just the typesetting. There's some semantic information about what these functions are. So you can do things like tell me about continued fraction results involving determinants. The, the last slide or second to the last slide is, how can we do this that doesn't involve Eric and Michael and Chris and Todd typing this in by hand? Because there's a lot you can do with OCR and various other things. But as a proof of concept in a limited time, 
and wanting to produce something beautiful and nice. Yeah, we did it by hand. And all of us work on very big projects, so, so what if it's 600 papers and 1,000 identities or whatever? We can do that in a year, no problem. So down, okay, now we get to some of the more interesting stuff, concepts involved. So it talks about associated parent continued fractions, and I'll forgive you all if you haven't heard of associated parent continued fractions. In Wikipedia, it would be a link, and for us, it's kind of a link too, except basically, there we go. So you don't know what that is, there you go. There's a nice description of it. Uh, let me see if I can go back here. So it's all interlinked in that way. Apologize, the web is being a little slow here. Okay. Then we have a couple other interesting things, at least to Mathematica users. We can actually say what Mathematica functions. These are, of course, all hyperlinks. Uh, and we know something about the proof date. And we know who proved it. So a little bit more on that later. And we can do things like timelines, because we have all the data in computational form. So you can start mixing and matching different pieces and slicing things in different ways and looking for patterns um, using the data that's encoded in the computer rather than having to know it or having your grad student know it or doing the literature uh, search yourself. And uh, of course, because we did the literature search and coded it up, we can actually, we know everything about this particular paper. We can link you to it at Mass MassSciNet or Centralblad or various other places. And we know theorems that appeared in that paper. So if you know a paper and you want to know what appears in it, we can tell you. OK. So one not, not entirely trivial thing that you can do using this is, of course, you can say, well, what theorems were proved from a certain period of time, be it a century, a particular year? And um, well, we can tell you. Now, there's a little bit of a glitch on the website right now. So we're not giving you the names of these, which is a little <coughs> annoying. So let me just switch to the pre-cached one and switch back to a resolution where it's not all blocky. You can see here we have a list of them in the normal Wolfram Alpha form. And I know it's too small to read, but trust me, we give a list of the actual theorems. And down at the bottom are links that will take you to them. Let's see if I can find my scroll bar. There you go. There's all the entrained information about them and who proved them and whatnot. Uh, again, I mentioned, of course, you want to prove stuff. Or, or you want to ask for meta information about results, well, this is Wolfram Alpha. So once we put that in, we can hook into anything else that Wolfram Alpha knows about. So you want to know who Moritz Stern and Otto Stoltz are, we can just instantly tell you. We can, in fact, give you a picture. And furthermore, I don't know if you can read that, but it, we can tell you other mathematical things that those people did. And that all kind of just comes for free. Once you've built the infrastructure and you've built the connections, if somebody else has a list of you know, pictures of people, or this is Wikipedia page hits on the bottom. So you can see how popular these people are in uh, page hits per day, which is, just, just for reference, the scale is 14 is the high. So the answer is not very in the world at large, but still of interest to people who uh, are interested in continued fractions. Here's an example of um, what I was mentioning before. You, you know that there's some theorem about quadratic irrationals involving continued fractions that you like, but you can't remember what it is. Well, you just say, natural language, tell me continued fraction results involving quadratic irrationals. And this isn't all of them, but this is the ones we know. And this is probably a good subset of what there is out there, because we've gone through a lot of papers. And we can entrain them all. We can give you more, and, and so forth. So you're kind of getting the idea. Th this is an example of. Um, the case that I mentioned earlier, where again, you, you have a particular object and you want to know, well, what theorems or what objects apply to it. So there's a particular list of applicable theorems that apply to it that we know about and applicable algorithms. And furthermore, we can apply the algorithm. So there's something called a Pippinger continued fraction. We can give it to you. And in fact, we can give you pseudocode in Mathematica because we happen to use Mathematica. Of course, we did this all in Mathematica. Uh, similarly, if you have a particular uh, individual continued fraction, we've encoded all this. We know kind of what arguments, what things apply to. So we can tell you all these theorems, all of which are clickable, apply to an expression of this kind. And on and on and on. You can tell about extensions. This is a kind of fun one. So we've had to add semantic meaning to most of these results. And once you have it semantically, you can 
do not only trivial computations, but some non-trivial ones. So for many of these, we actually just went ahead and added some interact interactive visualizations as well. So people who haven't heard of continued fractions may still have heard of this Kinchin constant law, which basically describes a property of um, what the terms of a continued fraction look like. And if you take their sort of geometric mean, most numbers, most real numbers with a, a small exceptional set converge to this one particular constant, which is about two, what, let's see, what is it? It's about, that's about whatever that number is on the screen. So with this interactive manipulate, within the Wolfram Alpha website, we can just trivially hook this up to a set of sliders where you can change the value being visualized. And if the theorem holds, this doesn't prove the theorem, but it gives you a quick sort of visual indication of what's going on. And it does, in fact, converge to the dotted line. Actually, that looks like one, doesn't it? So I suspect what, I suspect what my colleague Michael did is ratioed it to the continued fraction. There you go. Someone can read labels better than I can. Yep, so that's what it does. Well, you'd certainly want to unify all these things and not duplicate the effort. But, I mean, in some sense, once we encode this, we, we get most of those for free. There's, there's a single piece of code that can handle theorems of a certain class, or if it, it, it's still some handwork, but you can automate large portions of it. Right now, the answer to your question is there isn't really interaction between the two, but there could be. Maybe there should be. Okay. Uh, let's see. Similarly, we can, we can do all kinds of queries and return results for algorithms related to continued fractions. Uh, this is a particular algorithm, and we can start returning things like complexity, and again, with references and timelines. Uh, we can do the same for another algorithm, and here's a, just sort of an example of, it's, I know that's too small to read, but that's actually a Mathematica implementation of the algorithm, which we had to do in order to get the visualization and check the theorem and everything. So in most cases, if we bothered putting it in here, we have not only a semantically tagged version, but also a mathematic Cully computable version. And so you can apply theorems to particular expressions or apply algorithms in this case. That's all built in. And um, the second to last part is the actual identities. So besides results, concepts, whatever, something that people are very interested in is computing in closed form various continued fraction identities. And Mathematica does a very good job of this. But there's more known than Mathematica knows, at least at the moment. So we collected all these together, nicely formatted and displayed them. Here's an example of the sorts of queries that you can type into Wolfram Alpha and get some nice results that I don't think you can find anywhere else. So if you want to find all continued fraction identities that are related to a particular constant or special function, just ask continued fractions for whatever. And there you go. There's a list of the ones we know about, some of which are more obscure than others, but all of which are quite beautiful. I can click on a particular one. I should be able to click on a, there we go. And there we go. You can see we know that. Not only that, we know all, everything about its convergence regions. We can give you the convergence in closed form sometimes. We can give you transformed forms. Uh, and we can give you references. So this is. I think like the Gradstein and Rizik of continued fractions that we've put together here. And um, again, most of that is due to the, uh, the hard work of Oleg Marachev, who um, not only has gone to the trouble of collecting what's in the literature, but in many cases he's, he's actually done what we weren't supposed to do, which is fundamental research, and come up with new stuff and extensions and fix the literature. So here's a very famous result in continued fraction theory. Uh, but it turns out it's much more convenient for computations to give it in this general form. Basically, for anything that's got a quadratic term in the numerator and a linear term in the denominator, et cetera, we have other classes of these. There it is, is a ratio of two hypergeometrics. And this was not known. This is not in the literature. But Oleg derived a general formula that probably covers, I don't know, however many of the previously published ones. So whenever you go through something encyclopedically, you, you always find connections and, and can subsume other things. Yes, I, I'm, please, please pick up the talk if you're interested and go through more of the examples. Uh, I'm basically out of time, but let me just go through 
uh, real quickly, the, the references are kind of the least sexy because, you know, how, how, uh, how computable can a reference be? But it's kind of interesting from the point of view that, at least in Wolfram Alpha, references are important. If you say the melting point of whatever is whatever, you kind of care about where you got that information or if you computed that information. So that, people go to a lot of trouble in Wolfram Alpha to try to make that association but sometimes more successfully than others, and it's usually not to an actual paper. You know, it's usually to a, a website or a particular database. So this is kind of an exploration of how you could do that, and maybe, maybe we'll be doing more of that. Okay, so to sum up, uh, what are the challenges in this? Stan already uh, alluded to the first one. The first challenge is it's extremely labor-intensive the way we did it. And furthermore, the laborers have to kind of be very expert both in Mathematica and in the subject matter. So, this approach is not scalable, shall we say. It, it's pretty nice as a proof of concept, but if we're gonna do it in a bigger way, we need more bodies, we need more tools, and we need more automation. None of which is impossible, but none of which is easy. Naming of things is also hard. Most theorems and results in math or in any other subject are not named. So the fact that you need to actually name something and you need to provide a linguistic handle to get to it is also a challenge but I don't think anybody else knows how to completely solve that one either. There are, however, another, a number of strengths. So one is we standardize things as we go through them. The literature is notoriously non-standard notation-wise with respect to date notations change. As we go through, all the P's and Q's become capital A's and B's. All the indexing conventions become the same. So it adds some value in the sense that if you come to a result, not only is it verified, but it's in some standard notation when you read it or try to use it. Um, the other good thing is once you have it in Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha, you can get it out in any form you want. So Mathematica can go to XML, can go to tech, so you do it once, you can basically generate in any form you want. And there has been some interest in it. The, the, there's not huge numbers on these, but there, there are two plots. The top one is um, the year that we've been working and releasing ECF, which is significantly higher. That's total number of continued fraction queries on Wolfram Alpha. The bottom is the year before and the baseline. So there's some interest in it. I have a list of top 10 queries, which I don't have time to go in uh, in detail, but the, the most popular is the handwritten style continued fraction theorems that hold for Lebesgue measure zero. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but we have this cool kind of handwritten, I think students do it just as a joke. But anyway, if you type this into um, Wolfram Alpha, you'll get the result, but in a kind of a cute handwritten form. There's more work to be done. Oleg has done even more that I haven't had a chance to hook up yet. Um, we're exploring opportunities with um, other people in the company, with partners at U of I and elsewhere, to figure out how we could scale this up and automate it. And the Sloan Foundation is very interested in that. So those conversations will continue. And um, just like to thank the people involved, my coworkers, and you, the audience, for listening to me today. Gone a little bit over time, but hopefully still left a little bit of room for questions. Thank you very much.